It is yet another Friday. Hello, everyone. I am Steph Lee, the founder of Host Agency Reviews, and this is the Friday 15, where every Friday at 12 p.m. Central Time, we go ahead and answer your industry questions. And we have some questions today, and I also have a co-host. So hello, Bill. How are you? Good, Steph. Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing well. Oh, good. So if you don't know Bill, Bill Coyle is the VP of Agent Engagement over at KHM Travel Group. Uh, he's been in the business a really long time. Uh, his family's owned an agency um, and he's been through many, we'll talk about this um, in the questions, but they've had many iterations through the years, um, kind of on what they're focusing on. So he's a great wealth of knowledge. Um, so let's see, the first thing I wanna remind everyone of is we have a new reminder set up. So if you're a real big fan of the Friday 15, but find it hard to remember, um, to log in. Um, first of all, you can always watch it at your leisure. It's on our YouTube channel or our podcast feed. But if you want to watch it live, you can go up and sign up for reminders for the Friday 15 at postagencyreviews.com slash Friday 1515. Um, and there'll be a place for you to sign up for email reminders there. So Bill, let's get started. Um, and by the way, for those of you that are just listening and don't have a visual, Bill has this beautiful office background that is so fancy pantsy. <laughs> Got this big arched window. And before we came on today, he was getting his lighting right. And he was like, hold on, let me let me just adjust that. And he pulls up like a a little remote control and he's got these power shades that came down. <laughs> so yeah, I'm cool. so blessed. We're on the third floor of a pretty high level in our town. So I'm so blessed to have a good view. And actually out the back view, we can see 17 towers in the winter, water towers. So it's it's a huge view up on this hill. So we're very blessed to be here. Oh, that's super cool. I'm on the third floor too. And I have views of other people's rooftops, which is very exciting. <laughs> I saw your mom's post the other day that showed you guys out in the yard or doing something. So I oh. recognize I'm like, oh, that's the house. Yep. We were doing, we were doing um, a seed party. And so you'll be happy to know that off my like third floor office window right here, <laughs> I'm like the classy house that has, I use every space possible on our lot for gardening. And so our, our, the roof of our porch has all these five gallon buckets with tomato plants on them. <laughs> That's all right. We're I, nowhere I know. to go to, for tomatoes this summer. I know. I'm like, I'm the crazy plant lady. So <laughs> I love it. But but I'm also a crazy travel lady. So let's um let's dive into that. So here's our first question today, Bill. So um Megan S says, I'm slowly starting an FIT adventure travel planning line of business after doing it for free and for fun for years. Until I've trialed and errored and settled on a business model, I don't have enough bandwidth for this on top of my full-time job to make paying host agency fees worthwhile. However, a host agency, legit and well-reviewed on HAR, et cetera, offered me a mentorship arrangement where I could do bookings through them as I work with a few clients and learn the ropes. I wouldn't be paying agency fees, but they take a large split of any revenue on the bookings. Before actually signing anything, I'll do the same due diligence I would for a traditional host agent arrangement. And assuming that checks out, this sounds fair and great to me, but it doesn't seem like it's a common arrangement. Is it? And any advice on things to look out for on making the most of this unusual arrangement? Thanks so much for any insights. So, Bill, what are your thoughts on this? First of all, Steph, don't you agree that Megan's done an amazing job of research and understanding the industry and the business before just jumping in and not knowing what's going on? I, I agree for not having been in the business. She's definitely got her her T's crossed and her I's dotted. Absolutely. And I love that she's thinking about, you know, that foreign independent travel, that FIT along with adventure. So that's really cool that she's going in that direction. It's a little more unique than the typical mass marketed sales that are out there. So really kudos to you, Megan, for, for going through the extra mile to um, understand and, and gain knowledge before you just jump right in. So the thing that scares me the most about there's two there's two portions of this one that i like is the idea of the mentorship love that idea but the thing that scares me is those words large portion of my commission right yeah so that that becomes a little bit of a, of a concernment right because our model as you know steph is that we give most of the commission to our travel advisors out there right because they joined us they took confidence in us uh we we're we like to make a few dollars off of them but not the majority of it so it all depends on what their relationship looks like how long are we talk about being with them if someone has that many people um 
um, in their host agency and has staffing for it, that's great. The flip side, I would say, is to say, um, gosh, for a minimal investment and hopefully a good out clause in your contract, it's probably worth it to jump in full-fledged to the host agency, uh, pay the fee to jump in, even if it's a payment plan, which hopefully they have, and then have an out clause if you don't find yourself taking advantage of all those resources or benefit at a much higher commission percentage. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, because you know when I read this, it's a little hard, Megan, to give like very specific advice just because we don't know what that like large um, payment that they're taking or cut that they're taking. Because so this is my experience in the travel industry. So with host agencies, um, I would say almost all of the mainstream travel agencies take commissions of 70, 80, 90, um, and some even have like 100% commission plans. But so if if the person that you're working with is offering you like a 40%, like where they, you get 40% of the commission or 50 or 30, I would say there are probably better deals out there for you. Um, and in terms of whether or not it's a super common arrangement, I wouldn't say it's super common, especially for larger hosts that have more structure with kind of how people can sign up. However, this type of like mentorship, I, I would say is fairly common for smaller host agencies, more boutique host agencies that offer more one-on-one -on -one, um, type of training and mentoring. So um, let's see, the, the other thing I would, I would say is because it sounds like this might be kind of a one-off thing that they're doing that isn't normally publicized on their site, is I would make sure to clarify exactly what that mentorship means and, and get it in writing if you can, whether it's just in a contract or just, you know, back and forth with a person, but so that your expectations are correct of what this mentorship is including. Like, you know, are they doing monthly calls with you or weekly meetings with you? Yes, or is it yes. just whenever you're, because you're doing FIT and adventure, those that's a little bit, I, I would say, Bill, it's a lot, it's a little bit harder to train on because it's so different for every single booking. Um, that, and that is such a good point because we need to do a lot of research in order to get into that adventure situation. So is it adventure that's outside of a norm? And when I say that, I mean, is it something that's already built through a supplier mm -hmm. that you're reselling that or are you creating and crafting your itinerary where you're going to need a lot more elements of it and potentially a fee in order to make that work financially for you? Yeah. And if you have, Megan, it sounds like you've been doing this for a while. So if you already know the suppliers that you're going to want to be using, that's another thing to consider um, because the host agency is probably going to have suppliers that they want to use. Um, so you yeah. want to make sure that that's kind of um, on the same page as well. So um, well, yeah. And I would say the last thing is look at that contract with them because it sounds like you're not planning to stay for the long term. Um, so make sure that you know what's expected when you leave the agency, who the clients belong to that they've helped out with. Are they yours or do they stay with the host agency? Um, and then what would happen if you have bookings on the books and want to leave? Like how do you transfer bookings? Is that available? Those are all things to consider. Good point stuff. That's exactly right. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Certainly. Yeah. Um, all right. So that was a great question, Megan. Thanks for writing it in. And if you're listening or watching and you have a question for us, you can go to hostagencyreviews.com slash Friday15, or you can drop it in the chat or comments if you're watching it on YouTube. So, um, oh, you know what? Actually, the other thing I want to show Megan um, is, all right. So the I want to show two resources. So the first is um, our independent contractor agreement, like things to look for in the contract. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. And up in our search bar, I'm just going to type in contract. And then there's one called independent travel agent contracts. And if you click on this, this will give you an example of a sample contract so you can kind of know what to expect. Um, and different things that you should be making sure to look at, like can you have dual affiliation? Um, what's the seller of travel compliance? Um, the, the sales quotas or minimums or what's the term of the contract? So lots of things in there that I think could be helpful for you. And then the other thing I would look at is we also have, it sounds like you're pretty set on this host agency, but if you're are kind of looking around, you know, if they're giving you 
um, just 30%. And you might want to look for something different that's out there. We also have a host agency commission plan calculator. Oh my gosh. I did not know these resources were on this site. This is unbelievable. <laughs> oh, well, I'm so glad you're on today, Bill, to share this with you. So, Jeez. yeah, I just, well, now I forgot what I typed in. I think it was like host agency commission, commission. plan calculator. But yep. um, so if you go in here, it'll kind of explain a little bit more about um, the, the commission splits and you can type in um, numbers to see like which host agency is the best deal. And it also gives you like common things. So for you're asking if this like no fee, but taking a large cut is common. Um, and you can see here that, you know, the average, the most common commission split on the low end is 70. So if you're below that, that's definitely not average. Um, the most common higher commission split is 90. So it gives you a lot of data within here too, to kind of look at. Um, all right, so I'm gonna turn this off and we'll also put those links in the show notes. So next question, Bill, are you ready? I think I'm ready. Okay, so, well, this one's actually pretty short and it's from Anonymous. So they said, I read your article on Travel Consortium, but I'm confused. Is the consortium of your host agency important? What should I be asking and looking for? They all look so similar. I, this is, I feel for that. Yeah, this is such a great question. And, uh, uh, one that our agents, uh, our advisors ask quite frequently. And by the way, our advisors love your 15-minute segments on this. They they love to watch it. So thanks for continuing to do this stuff. Oh, yeah. It's so fun. I love having co-hosts. <laughs> um, you, you know, the idea of the consortia isn't always critical to your relationship, except when it comes to the suppliers, right? Are they all... Well, actually, Bill, can you just explain maybe just really quickly what a consortia is and how it's different from a host? You know, I'm so glad you said that because the consortia are a blessing to the industry. Let's face it. They are a unique body of people um, who came together to say, you know what, we need to help out. It was, you know, think about it. It was started off to help the smaller in, uh, agent a long time ago. Stay at a consistent commission level, offer products and services and resources to agencies who, who couldn't necessarily have that buying power, right? Yep. So it doesn't necessarily help you in pricing. It helps you in commission income, in resources that might be available, marketing resources that are out there. I hear your alarm going off. I don't know off. why this happens. <laughs> I even checked it before we started. It's, okay. so it's like we're in church and <laughs> the priest is, or the pastor is going to say, turn off your cell phone. So sorry. No worries. It's a good it's a good distraction. Um, but there, there's there's a lot of value to the consortia and we're, we're fortunate that they're together. How does that relationship look with either a retail or a brick and mortar agency and compared to a host agency, right? So it's that it's that power that comes together and says, hey, we are we have all of these resources available for you. We have all these marketing dollars and everything else we're putting together and it trickles down into you and your agents, right? Or your mm -hmm. advisors. So that's how it's best suited, right? And there's, you know, there's, there's a lot that are out there, um, but there's some mainstream ones that are out there as well. So it's the idea of how does how does the how do the um, the preferred suppliers with that consortia impact the host agency, which ultimately impacts you? Because if let's just say uh, let's just go back to Megan, maybe Megan is in a more unique uh, situation where a mass marketed supplier is not going to necessarily help her be beneficial for her, but there mm -hmm. might be some unique suppliers, and there are luxury suppliers in there that are going to be beneficial. So look for that relationship. Go to that website, check them out, make sure you understand understanding who their top suppliers are, and then have that conversation with your host agency or, or brick and mortar agency, whichever one it's going to be. Um, but in this case, host agency to say, you know what, what is your relationship with them and what percentage of your business is with those companies versus other companies who might not be in this preferred supplier list? Ask those questions because they're excellent to ask. You are going to ultimately go in the direction that those suppliers are taking you in through that host agency. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. And I'm going to put a link in the comments and in the show notes that to an article that kind of explains more in depth what a, the role the travel consortia play because it is it's a little bit hard to explain especially if you're outside of it, but they they have a very unique niche within the industry. And yeah. and I would say like one thing to note anonymous is that on um har so if say so KHM, like Bill's agency, is associated with, they're aligned with Travel Leaders Network. 
So if you're like on our site and right now on the homepage, I'll just say I'm looking for a consortium. Um, if you are like are just in love with travel leaders, let's say you can click on their profile. And one of the nice things is you can find out a little information about their profile, hopefully read some reviews. But um, then if you go down, you can see all the host agencies that belong to that um, consortia. So that could be something you could look at. If, for instance, you know that um, you, you want to belong to a certain consortia. And I, I, I will say like one of the big differences between the consortia, because they have a lot of similar programs, you know, they all have email marketing programs, yeah. they all have direct mail programs. But one of the big differences um, and something you might want to consider is do they have a consumer facing brand? So Travel Leaders Network has a consumer facing brand, which can be very powerful. Um, because there's trust that comes with that. And Virtuoso is another one that has a very strong consumer facing brand. Um, so that can be something that you could use to differentiate consortia. But unfortunately, that's about all I've got for you. Um. Well, that's pretty darn good. My gosh, that's a lot of good information. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully that's helpful, Anonymous. Um, you know, you're not alone. Don't feel like you're alone um, and that they all look so similar, especially as you're just starting out. You'll be, as you get into the industry, you'll be able to kind of tell the nuances. Yes. All right. So our last question comes from Natalie H. And Natalie says, figuring out my niche, I'm still figuring it out. A list of categories would be helpful to be able to Google for those of us with passion, but zero industry knowledge. What are some niche categories? What do you got here, Bill? Wow. Lots of great things. So niche, I think we've seen probably uh, a strong percentage of our advisors going toward the niche market, especially after the fact that we spent years staff telling people, I am an all service travel agency. Yes. I do everything, right? So it's like, oh my goodness, you know, what we've learned in the last couple of years is maybe we want to focus in, right, on a, on a specific niche. Um, could it be a lifestyle, a sport, um, a religion? Uh, is yoga part of it? Is it something that you want to do? Is it a destination? Um, just look at what Megan was talking about when I talked about adventure travel. There's so many different things that could be in the niche, um, product driven. Um, I, I'll say brand driven. Maybe you're maybe you're geared just toward a specific brand because it's easy to market yourself. Um, back in the 90s um, and the early 2000s, we rebranded our agency because we were a corporate agency doing a lot of corporate airline tickets into a leisure agency. And we happened to brand with Apple Vacations because they were in our market and very strong there. So that could be something that you're niche on. And then we expanded our market from there because it was funny, after so many years of selling all-inclusive destinations, we're like, hey, do you want to go somewhere else? We're like, we didn't know you sold somewhere else. We thought you only did that. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, you know, working in and out of a niche is important and critical to think of when that timing is, but it's also awesome to be in some type of a niche. Just think about the South Pacific or Hawaii. You know, maybe it's honeymoon travel, but there's a lot of variations to that. And I think that, I think it's good to start there. Or potentially, if you've been the um, multi-service, all-service agency, to go in that direction if you're considering it for the future. Yeah, and and I'm I'm well. So <laughs> when she wrote in, Natalie was writing in because she was she was reading I think our finding a niche article, which I'll I'll show really quickly. But Natalie, I want you to know that because of you, I've gone ahead and done something I should have done a long time ago. So up in the search results, I'm just um, typing in, actually, hold on, let me refresh this. I'm typing in niche up here, but I went ahead and added um, into our niche article examples of niches. So there's a whole list in here of accessible travel, corporate, destination specialist, Disney, family travel, luxury travel, LGBTQ+, heritage travel, MICE, which is meetings, incentives, conventions, conferences, and um, events, you know, ocean cruising, river cruising, weddings, honeymoons, wellness travel. Um, so there's also like a brainstorming guide on here to kind of help you find a niche that you're going to be really passionate about. So make sure to take a look at that. We'll put that in the comments, but hopefully that helps you out um, and, and gives you some ideas. And thank you for helping improve the resources on the site. I'm so embarrassed. I never thought of this, Natalie. Thank you. Well, you've certainly expanded it really, really fast. That's for sure, uh, Steph. 
Well, thank you. I'm just on Jeez. top of life, Bill. You know me. <laughs> yes, you take action. You know, I think that we need to we need to change the name of your site or your company to. I, I just want to be a travel agent. Like, guide me in the right direction. You've got all this great information on there, so I know we appreciate it from our perspective because they learn so much before they come to us. Yeah. Well, thank you. We, you know, that's kind of our goal is to make it so it's accessible to everyone and that people that are joining the industry or making the right decision, that they're not going in blindfolded and being like, wait a second, this isn't what I thought. Like, yes. you know, we want people to be successful. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, you know, that is wrapping up our Friday 15. So thank you everyone for joining us. Again, if you want to make sure you don't miss out on the next Friday 15, um, you can go to hostagencyreviews.com slash Friday 15 and sign up for reminders there. Bill, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Steph, and thanks that for all that you do in our industry. We appreciate you. Yay, yay. All right. Well, have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and we will see you next week.